Ve Okay, well, hello. Is it okay if I get started? That would be great. Okay. Thanks, Gregory. Hey, everybody. My name is Gregory Whiting. I'm one of the two newest board members for SBT. Tali, who is also with us, is one of the other two newest board members of SVP. Um, good afternoon. Welcome to our Seattle Winter Partner Meeting. Um, I would love for you all to digitally say hello. So get there in the chat. Uh, let people know who you are. Let them know uh, what the best name is to use for you and, and how best to refer to you. So which, which pronouns are best for you? Um, my name is Gregory. I go by Gregory. I use he and pronouns. Uh, in general, we're just looking at having so many people here. I wanna make sure that we don't have people speak over each other. So unless I miss something, um, please keep yourself muted um, and uh, you know, feel free to message me in the chat too if there's something missing so that we don't have people talk over each other. Uh, I joined SVP in the fall of 2019, which uh, kind of doesn't feel like it exists anymore. It's hard to imagine the, the world back then, but uh, one thing that is consistent from that time to now is that I felt a lot of promise and wonder and excitement about SVP. Um, like a lot of people, my memory is hazy from the before times, but I do remember being uh, invited to an SVP meeting and uh, seeing a fellow board member and now friend uh, John Kaufman speak on stage about uh, the transformative experience of being a part of SVP, uh, not just in terms of figuring out where to allocate capital and time and talent, but the personal transformation process that comes from uh, taking all of our um, important areas of change seriously and figuring out how we are personally related to these things that we want to change in the world around us. Um, and it's not limited to John alone. Uh, I found with my engagement with other board members and SVP staff, uh, current and former staff, that, that was really a shared value. Um, before we get started, I just want to acknowledge that, you know, while this is a virtual meeting, SVP Seattle uh, and, and where I am currently, uh, we're physically located on the unceded ancestral lands of the Coast Salish peoples. Um, the traditional home of all tribes and bands within the Duwamish, Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. Um, and we want to recognize that, you know, while I'm using the term ancestral, um, that history is something that we're living through, creating and impacting right now. Um, those lands are unseated and they remain unseated. Uh, we're still using those lands were still uh, occupying space that, that really wasn't given to us uh, for our use. So I want to acknowledge that. Um, and I'd like to thank uh, all of these people for caretaking, uh, for their caretaking of this land. We have a lot to learn from our peers, our community members who come from communities that have been here much longer than us and managed to uh, uphold the vast nat uh, natural wealth of this land. Um, and you know, I also wanna acknowledge that a land acknowledgement or even a you know, broken treaty acknowledgement is not enough. Um, it doesn't cover the fact that we don't all have authentic relationships with indigenous peoples and indigenous uh, individuals and tribes. And really, this is just the beginning. So for a lot of people, this is an aha moment. They're learning something new, but there's multiple steps to go through with this process. I, I work for Food Lifeline. Um, I wear many hats, it's one of my hats. And that's a process we're going through as an organization where we started to uh, donate money to Real Rent Duwamish. And we even include that in our new higher orientation for staff to let them know where our values are. So I would encourage other people to find their ways to go beyond the acknowledgement. Um, getting back to what I had shared about SVP, 
Uh, like I said, you know, I, I came into SVP in 2019 uh, based on social connection. Uh, I learned very quickly um, that SVP is really about building connections with philanthropists, the nonprofit sector, uh, communities that are impacted, communities that are adjacent to impacted communities, um, and really figuring out, you know, what ties us together uh, in terms of our values. Um, organizationally, <clears throat> SVP understands that working together helps us to achieve our vision of a Puget Sound region where everybody is going to thrive. And uh, when I mean everybody, I don't mean um, just people who are lucky enough to be engaged or to be found by the work that we're doing or the work that we want to do. We want everybody to get their needs met, regardless of their income, race, or other circumstances. Um, the only way through this is to do it together. And uh, for all the obvious reasons, when you look at the news, you think about what's going on in the world, um, this is more salient now than, than ever before. Today, what we're gonna do is we're gonna meet with community uh, partners who are do doing work to directly attack the inequities that we face. Uh, and we come together to celebrate our accomplishments and to acknowledge the path we will walk together to a future that will live up to our mission. Uh, we reimagined SVP uh, Seattle and launched our reimagined programs this past September, so fall of 2021. And, um, you know, part of that has been a new grant committee, which we're going to uh, we're gonna have an announcement for uh, later in our program uh, that's related to our new grant committee, our co-creation cohort, and our advocacy. Uh, today, we're going to hear from many SVP leaders. We're going to hear about our new advocacy work. Um, we're going to meet our newest multi-year grantee partner organization, which is very exciting. Um, and just to get started, you know, I really am excited to announce that um, we're going to be joined by a longtime SVP Seattle partner and board member. Um, I feel very much uh, like a new person to the party. But Dr. Julie Pham has been with SVP uh, for much, much longer than me. Um, Dr. Pham has over 15 years of community organizing uh, experience, including building a cross-sector collaboration fellowship for the tech industry, founding an ethnic media coalition, running a Vietnamese language newspaper, mobilizing small business owners in South Seattle, and eight years of academic research. Um, Dr. Pham has combined all of these experiences to start a consulting practice called Curiosity Based, which focuses on fostering curiosity, collaboration, and inclusion in the workplace. Um, please join me in welcoming Dr. Julie Pham. Thank you so much, Gregory, and I hope that your time on the SVP board is as fruitful and as fun as the time, the six years that I got to spend on the SVP board. I am so honored to get to be here because SVP is a very important organization for me. I met great friends, even my partner through volunteering, and I always thought of belonging to SVP as an investment in my own learning. So I titled this talk, Curiosity, Empathy, and Philanthropists. And by philanthropist, I mean anyone who seeks to promote the welfare of others, especially by the generous donation of money to uh, good causes. And I was careful not to use the word philanthropy because I'm not talking about the whole field of philanthropy. I'm talking about individual philanthropists. And I believe everyone here is a philanthropist. And so from my days at SVP, I remember these great workshops on equity matters and how to understand systems of oppression and the power dynamics within philanthropy, and it really helped me understand the big picture. I'm actually gonna be taking a different approach in my talk, one that is personal and also emotional. So last January, I started my own company called Curiosity Base because I believe so deeply that curiosity is at the core of resilience, resourcefulness, open-mindedness, creativity, humility, and empathy. And based on my years of community building, I've seen time and time again that curiosity, that is, the desire to know and to learn can help people, can help teams collaborate better and with more joy. So for this talk though, I am going to focus on the curiosity that you can have about yourself and about others. 
And when I, um, when you get more curious about yourself, you also become more self-aware. And when you get curious about others and you allow others to get curious about you, that is when you can start to build authentic relationships across difference. So, um, so today I'm gonna, uh, a lot of my work is around helping people increase self-awareness to build relationships and to communicate with curiosity by asking clear questions and listening deeply. So today I'm actually gonna guide us through practicing and reflecting on curiosity and empathy. Empathy is being able to share and understand the feelings of others. And empathy lives at the individual level. Now I've heard organizations include curiosity and empathy in their values. I actually don't think that an organization can be curious or empathetic. It's the collection of people within that organization that ensures that those values are, are operationalized. So this talk is going to be interactive. And I see a few people in the, um, in, in the audience who've been through some of my workshops. So you'll, 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 you'll know, what, you'll know what, what you're getting ready for. So I'm gonna take you through a couple of scenarios followed by a few short polls. And I'll share those general answers and we'll, have a, um, we'll, um, we'll comment on that. And then we're going to transition into another exercise where I'll give you some time to write down answer, uh, an answer to a prompt question. And then we'll actually get some time to connect with one another. And we'll put you into breakout rooms with one other person so you can discuss what you wrote. I am not going to tell you the objectives of the prompts ahead of time because I don't want to color your reactions. Now, I know that this approach can frustrate some people because there's some people like, I want to know why we're doing it before we do it. And I'm, I'm just gonna ask you to trust the process. Now with a group this big, and because we actually don't have that much time together, I'm going to prioritize getting as many comments shared through the chat window um, as possible instead of having a few people share verbally. So please put any clarifying questions that you have in the chat and the SVP staff, they're gonna monitor the chat to see if there's anything that needs to get answered immediately to clarify the, the exercises and to alert me. Otherwise, it's actually really hard for me to look at the chat and to facilitate this conversation. So I just want to thank you for your understanding and your patience. And also, uh, please know that I'm happy to have a later conversation with you if you have deeper questions and just to reach out. So we're going to go into our first scenario. So I'm going to read, um, I'm going to read a scenario and I want you to imagine, I just want you to imagine yourself in this um, in this situation. And then what's going to happen is after I read it, then um, Nin is going to, uh, Nin is from my team, and she's going to, she's going to put into the chat window a poll, but she won't do it until after I read this. So first scenario, you met Chris, who was thinking of starting a nonprofit to serve their community. A friend you volunteer with introduced the two of you. Chris becomes an acquaintance of yours. They even seek your advice because they know how involved you are with nonprofits. And although you have encouraged them, you've actually never offered to donate. They ask to meet with you and during your conversation, they ask you to donate. It's something you can afford. So now I want you to think about how do you generally feel about Chris asking you for your financial support in that word? So Nin is going to pop into the chat window, the poll. And it's just two questions.
Did I just, hello? Did I leave? Yes, I think, and now you're back. <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right, okay, great. I hope that wasn't for too long. Um, okay, so everyone can hear me? We're good? Yes. Okay, so now the second scenario. Imagine that you are a first time nonprofit startup founder and you are on friendly terms with Lynn an acquaintance who has significantly more financial resources than you. Now, Lynn has given you advice and has been encouraging of your nonprofit. And as of now, you've received donations from some of your friends and family. To help your nonprofit have more impact, you need a lot more funding and you are considering asking Lynn to donate. So now Nin is gonna pop into the window, uh, the next, the next um, poll and to ask, how do you generally feel about asking Lynn for support? All right, so we continue to pop in the answers. And what's gonna happen now is Nin is on the back end, Nin is going to create a graph so that she can, so that we can compare um, uh, scenario one and scenario two. And what I wanna do is start to read aloud some of the feelings that people had about scenario one, which is where you are being asked for, uh, where, where you are being asked for help. And, um, some of the answers I saw here were, we'll do this. I saw honored, intrigued, feel happy they asked, um, uh, supporting, expected, encouraged, strange, um, awkward, desire for more information. If you don't ask, you don't receive kudos, Chris. Uh, curious, gratitude, 
Do I feel confident in the program to invest meaningfully? Uncertainty, certainty. Um, I expected it. I'm willing to listen. So those are some of the feelings that people had when, uh, when I asked, how did you feel about being asked? And so now the question, I'm going to read it aloud some of the words of how people felt when they were, um, uh, when, how you were feeling when you needed to ask someone, when you need to ask Lynn. Um, conscious, nervous, fear of rejection, passionate, positive, trepidation, concern, embarrassed, fear, nervous, um, gratitude, humility. Will this negatively impact our relationship? Not sure how it'll turn out. I'll be hesitant, but do it anyway. Challenged, safe in asking a friend. Awkwardness, uh, reluctant. Um, I don't want to imply that my request for her advice was motivated by a need for money. Anxious. Even if they say no, I learned from this experience. I hate to ask for money. So you can see that there are quite a few, the, the differences in the, um, in how people felt, uh, the words that people use to describe um, how people felt about uh, asking for help versus, or versus being asked for help versus asking for help. And so now what I wanna do is I am going to show you the results of that comparing the feelings, the neutral versus negative and, uh, oh, sorry. Um, so this is, so what you see, oh, let me, let me share one moment. So what you're about to see is the chart that compares um, how you felt about being asked for funding versus you asking for funding. And, uh, and I asked you, were those feelings generally positive, neutral, or negative? And so what you can see here is that there's a lot of positive feelings around being asked for funding. There's actually quite a few positive feelings around asking for funding. Um, there's definitely, though, a lot more negative feelings around ask for you asking for funding versus being asked for funding. So um, I invite you to put into the chat window just any reflections or comments that you have about what you're seeing right now. Is anyone surprised? And in the meantime, I'm gonna just share um, that this exercise, that this, these questions were designed to, to get you to compare how you feel about asking versus about being asked. And empathy means trying to, trying to understand where people are coming from. And so to be truly empathetic, you can't just theorize or think about how you think that they'd feel. You actually have to put yourself in a situation um, where, you can, where you can imagine or better yet even experience feeling what they feel. And so that means getting clear about yourself and then about others. And so and understanding your own perspective, that your own perspective actually might just be particular to you. Um, and sometimes you might even project how you feel onto how others might feel. So Think about if you were just being asked for help or if you're thinking all these nonprofits out there are, are they need help and you might just say, oh, well, you just have to ask and let us know and think about um, what you need and let us know and we can help without actually realizing how difficult it might be because you haven't been in that situation yourself. So I intentionally created a scenario with a grassroots organizer with little traction or success indicators, someone who just has a passion for their community. And they're asking you to believe in them, not just support their cause. I didn't choose a large professional nonprofit with a development team and an experienced executive director because you'd probably evaluate your giving with them differently. And so I know at SVP, most of the funding is given through grants and that, these, that the grant committees review proposals. Well, also SVP um, amplif helps individuals amplify your own giving, your own personal giving. And I also wanna be clear, I'm not saying don't feel empathy for those who work at large nonprofits with professional fundraisers. I just want you to be aware that being empathetic requires being aware of people's, of their particular situation. And the choices that you make when giving to a nonprofit um, with a professional fundraising staff can be different from when you're giving to a small uh, grassroots organization for the first time. 
And so, for example, I remember when I was when I ran the Vietnamese, my family's Vietnamese newspaper for years, the staff consisted of me and th my family and three part time people. And it was always really frustrating when advertisers would ask for metrics as if we were this really big organization with and that we had the capacity to track, um, do all the kind of uh, tracking. Um, and they didn't understand that we actually have a small niche audience. So just so this is um, so we just practice empathy with some theoretical um, theoretical scenarios to get you to think about how, about the idea of asking for help made you feel. Now I actually want to put you in the position where um, you where you will think about uh, an ask that you're. Uh, something that you're considering asking and how that makes you feel. So um, with this, I'm going to need three volunteers. So if you could just put in the chat window, hey, I want to volunteer because I'm going to have three readers. And so just think about that and put your name in and I'll call you. And so um, and in the meantime, I'm going to talk about this next uh, this next prompt, which is think about uh, think about something that you would like to do or have that would improve your life. And here's the thing, you actually don't have the sufficient resources to, uh, to make this happen on your own, to make this reality. To make it happen, you have to ask for help from an acquaintance who has more, who may have more resources than you. You don't know, but you, who may has more resources than you. And you're not sure, here's the, here's, here's the thing, you're not sure how this person's gonna feel about you asking, and you don't know if they'll say yes or no. There's a real risk here that they could say no. And so resources can include financial support, time, um, uh, time, services, use of assets. Okay, I have Robert as one volunteer. Could I get two more volunteers, please? And because what I'm gonna, and all you have to do is read aloud. <laughs> so this is, I'm gonna give you some time to think about this, but in the meantime, I wanna go through three examples first. And since Robert, you're the first volunteer, could you unmute yourself and read this example? And I need two other people to read examples. Thanks, Gregory. And thanks, Alexa. Okay, Robert. Thanks. Okay, so example one, I need a dog sitter while I'm away. And I have a neighbor who always waves hello to my puppy when I take the pup for a walk. My usual dog sitter is not available and none of my friends could help. I only knew the neighbor by her first name, but I'm considering asking this neighbor will take, I'm considering asking this neighbor will take care of my dog. Thanks, Robert. Gregory, example two. I'm raising capital from my risky social venture and I've exhausted my circle of friends. I still need to raise $100,000. I think a few coworkers I haven't talked to in at least five years might be able to, and interested in investing. I'm considering reaching out to these former coworkers for help. Thanks, Gregory. Alexa Carver. Kim, someone I volunteer with, has a vacation home in Hawaii that they don't rent out and that is unused most of the year. I knew sometimes Kim lets their friends use it. I've always dreamed of going to Hawaii. I have some time off. While I can pay for food and my use and use my miles to cover my flight. I can't afford lodging. I'm considering asking Kim to borrow their place. Thank you, Alexa. Thank you for these three volunteers. So these are just examples of types of asks that you can make. What I wanna do now is give you four minutes to write this down, um, to think about an example. And if you can't think of something current, think about something that's happened in the past. And did you ask or not what ended up happening? And then what's going to happen is we're going to put you in breakout rooms so you can chat with one other person. So I'm going to play some music while you do this.
right, wrap up your thoughts. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna put you into breakout rooms and we want each person to share your story. And then I want you to, with the time left, think about what is the best that can happen if you ask and what's the worst that can happen. And also think about how you would like them to decline. If you know they're gonna say no, how would you like them to say no? So with that, Nin is going to put into the chat window the, the, these prompts so you can be reminded of that and you're gonna get five minutes with a partner. So see you in five minutes, enjoy your time together. Okay, is it just us now? <laughs> yes. All right. How do you think it's, yeah, I never look at people's faces. It always makes me too nervous. <laughs> <laughs> Good, you know, most people go off video, so it's hard to tell. There are like so many lovely pros to, um, so many lovely pros to. Are people still in the waiting room or like there's people dropping off and joining? Um, I'm I, back in the main room. I was in a breakout room by myself. So I'm happy to be reassigned or just let you all chat quietly. <laughs> we can put Janet and Lisa together. Yeah, I just, I'm sorry. I got off for a minute and I just came back. So great. Okay. Here, I'm going to put the prompt in again so that you know what it is. There's the prompt again. Lisa and Janet. So um, is there going to be an invite for me to click on? Yes. Just a moment. Okay. Hey, Pamela. Hey, I think I was in, ended up in a room by myself. I think whoever was there is not really on the call. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, oh, okay. So, all right. Just a you, Sorry, folks. So, all. let me know. All right. Here we go. All right. And Okay, is it just us now? All right. Should be. Yeah. It I had everybody at two, but some folks um got shy apparently and left <laughs> the breakout rooms. So that's that's what happens. But I think you know what have. happens is sometimes people are like, I didn't expect to work. <laughs> I didn't expect to like have to talk because <laughs> it is it is a pretty vulnerable thing to share with someone so and it throws you in <laughs> we've got one minute and 45 seconds left in the breakout okay. room and I've got I set it up for a 15 second warning right Yeah, and also, are you um, so? Are you going to send out a survey for the books? Because I also can set. Do, we can do an ebook too. Oh, that's great. If people, if you want to do an option, like, do you want? Yeah. Would you rather have an ebook or a physical book? Um, yeah. So we had we took attendance on the first twenty five people. So okay. we'll okay, okay, put them to see there. <laughs> that's how you do it. Right. <laughs> that's a great idea because I bet some people would want an ebook. Mm -hmm. Um, and then there's those of us who can't seem to convert no matter how hard they try me. Oh. So what I'll do just to, cause I know that you, um, you want to start at 1240. So I'll, as people come back, I'll just invite them to put into the chat message, any feelings that they have. And, um, and then I'm going to, and as they're doing that, I'm just going to read the conclusion and then I'll flash this last slide, which is reflect. 
and I have that as a um, oh wait a minute Nin let's do it okay actually here uh, you're looking for something yeah so can you um go to the end and this is like can you give them reflect on these questions um so go to the last um yeah i see you typing in that so just like put that in the chat window when they come back um when i flash this on the screen okay that way they'll have it on the screen okay on your queue okay great folks are coming back 15 okay. seconds thank you <laughs> Welcome back. I love you. Welcome back. Welcome back. People are trickling in. Okay. So what I for those who are already back, you can start thinking about what you want to put as a reflection in your in the chat window there. And you can just put a reflection on that conversation that you had with your partner. And I'm having a hard time sharing my screen. If I can't share it, then okay, here we go. All right, welcome back. Scott. So um, the room automatically closed, right? I'd expected a lot more people to come back by now. Yeah, you kicked us out. <laughs> Hello? I can, can you hear me, Julie? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. All right. Okay. Huh. Okay. So I just, do we know if everyone's come back yet? I think they have. Oh, okay. So we just, we lost some people. All right. So um, I just want to share, I, in those questions, you can put in the chat window, your reflections there. And also I remember running my own small uh, grassroots nonprofit for a year and how I had to run money for, uh, raise money for it. And it was really difficult. And I asked about 50 people to contribute. And there were three types of responses. There are those who replied and says, yes, I'll make some contribution. There are a few people who said, um, who replied and said they couldn't give and they wished me the best of luck. And the largest group of people were those who actually never wrote at all, who never replied. So imagine um, if you ask a specific person, You're still here. Oh, you're good. You can hear me? You can see yep. me? Okay, a few. Yep. I thought it went out. All right. So imagine if you um, imagine if you asked a specific person for help and they didn't respond to you at all. And what would be going through your mind? So I personally would rather, much rather get a no than a nothing at all. And so that's why I asked you to think about how would you want someone to decline? And then I want you to think about um, the people who asked you to donate and you never say anything at all. And so there is just remember that behind every email, even if it's a mass email, there's someone there's someone behind that who who would who um, who would want to feel acknowledged. So we often talk about the power dynamics between ask someone asking for donation and the donor, and we we don't talk about what that means to feel empathy. So empathy as a philanthropist doesn't require what people um, doesn't require people feeling what people are. Um, it doesn't require feeling what people who are asking for money feel and then giving. It just it just means acknowledging them. And that's actually one of the seven forms of respect that I write about, acknowledgement. For a lot of people, they just want to feel seen. So uh, what so there's just a series of takeaway questions now um, for you to think about. That's how I'm going to end this talk. Um, and Nin's going to put this in the chat window too. 
How are you declining people when they ask for support? Can you acknowledge people while still declining? What impact would that have on your relationship? Um, when do you in your own personal life risk asking for help? How can feeling empathy influence how you interact with others as a philanthropist? And how will this conversation that you had today influence whether you make that ask or not? So to have empathy, you have to put yourself in the position of taking a risk and asking for something. And you have to feel what the other person's feeling. It's easy to intellectualize philanthropy and to talk about how philanthropy can improve. And you as an individual philanthropist still have the choice to be empathetic, which may not change all of philanthropy. It will change your philanthropy though. So with that, um, if you do make the ask, I'd love to hear about it and see how it turned out. And, uh, and um, I know that, well, that is, that's just how I'm, I'm going to end my talk. So thank you. It's and also put in the chat window, if you want to connect, I mean, I will have one last thing, one special offer. I know the 25, first 25 people who came will get a free copy of my book. And if you subscribe to my newsletter today, I will also give you free access to my new digital course. And um, you can follow me on Curiosity Base and also my, um, my email. You can email me too. And so Nin has just put that in the chat window. And with that, I will turn it over to Emiko. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Pham. I cannot wait to check out your wisdom in your book. Um, and if I'm not one of the first 25, I will be emailing somebody that is so I can uh, get some of that, that action because I really appreciate what you shared. Your challenges to us to consider uh, what it's like to be on uh, multiple uh, in multiple perspectives with um, philanthropy. So thank you for that challenge. Next up, we're going to hear from our other newest member of the SVP Seattle Board of Directors, Ali, Tali Rausch. Tali is going to share the work of our newest program, Advocacy. Great, thank you so much, Gregory. Oh no, I'm on mute, sorry. No, you're unmuted now. Oh, you're I'm unmuted. Thank, thank you. So you. Yeah, yeah, you're here. You're present. OK. Um, yes, thank you. And thanks, everyone, for being here, taking time out of your day. Um, it's That was a great presentation and really struck home for me. I'm going to share a little bit about the nonprofit that um, I co-established to um, do advocacy work for fully funding education in our state. Um, but primarily, I'm really excited to talk about advocacy as one of our newest programs at SVP. And just so we're all um, established with the same foundation of it, the dictionary definition of it, advocacy is the act or process of supporting a cause or proposal. So advocacy as an act and to advocate as a verb involves interacting with elected officials in support of a cause or proposal. And I want to make sure to differentiate the clear difference between advocacy and lobbying, um, because lobbying is when we pay somebody to ad advocate to elected officials. But advocacy, as we're talking about it for SVP, is about us as um, citizens of the world and of our um, city and state. Uh, working with our elected officials, making sure that they represent um, the needs of, of us and our families and community. So I got into advocacy. I have a background in nonprofit work and the picture that you see is me and my three kids um, who attend uh, Seattle Public Schools. And I was inspired to get involved uh, in advocacy work in 2015 when the Seattle teachers went on strike, um, which created a huge outpouring of support from parents because it highlighted the crises that teachers were facing, in including, um, you know, not increase seeing their salaries, um, overcrowding in school classrooms. 
lack of recess, um, not getting the uh, support that they needed for um, addressing discriminatory, um, the way behavior issues were being um, handled uh, and serious equity issues um, were not being addressed. So um, it really happened super organically. I joined a group of parents. We co-founded Washington's Paramount Duty as a parent advocacy group and a grassroots advocacy group. And we just started very simply by creating a Facebook group and it exploded overnight. Um, it grew to over 5,000 members and that in itself was a form of advocacy. It showed legislators how frustrated people were with the state's inability to fully fund education as required by our constitution. Um, and in fact, legislators joined the group and mm -hmm would sometimes chime in about what they were trying to do. So um, it became a powerful advocacy tool. Uh, we spent 2016 preparing for the 2017 legislative session, which would determine the state budget for the following two years. And as an aside, um, for current times, next year will be the legislative session that establishes the budget for the following, for the following two years. So, um, that's important when we're talking about supporting our community partner organizations and um, their advocacy work for, um, for their budgets. So we organized events, we met the legislators, we participated in rallies, and we generally created public pressure, pressure to increase the education budget. And by 2018, the state did technically fulfill its financial requirement to fully fund education. Um, it allowed for long overdue statewide sal salary increases um, along with actually funding librarians um, and counselors, which were not fully funded before. And it also addressed the serious equity issues um, in terms of education funding across our state in Seattle, we have um, the ability to um, pass property taxes. We, we pass levies, we tax ourselves to um, basically supplement the budget, the education budget. But there are other cities and towns that don't do that. And then they don't have the finances to fix their buildings or build a new school as they need. And what happens is you see this in some of the Seattle public schools, they have what's called portables. They're like, these classrooms outside that they've sort of, the temporary classrooms that are built, um, they, uh, because they haven't been able to actually build the infrastructures. So um, there are other cities and towns across the state that can't pass levies and they end up with a lot of portables and um, inadequate uh, infrastructure for education and schooling. The other inequity, significant inequity that's reflected in Seattle and across the state is that there are lots of PTAs that are able to raise financial funds and they end up actually funding like counselors and librarians and nurses and tutors, um, which other schools, if they don't have those PTAs, they can't fund those resources, which really should be provided as a public service. Um, so those are ongoing inequities. And um, so the fight for fully funding education continues, increasing the funding. Um, but in back to the story of 2018, technically uh, education was fully funded. The state was no longer held in contempt, but the caveat became that a significant amount of money came from the rainy day fund. So, um, it's not a long-term, it was not a long-term solution. And that's why you hear a lot about um, the fight for capital gains and um, creating more revenue streams to address, um, because there is a lack of revenue due to our regressive and upside down tax system. Um, so you may have heard about the capital gains tax that was passed last year. It's currently being challenged in the courts. Um, and 
you'll hear a lot more about it. It's important to know what the funds are supposed are aimed to fund um, from the capital gains. It would fund early education. It's called the Fair Start for Kids Act. Um, and it would help reimburse childcare providers as well as um, general uh, preschool and early childhood education. So from this experience, which was significant and intense for two years of full-time volunteering, and that's where um, this presentation uh, really struck home because I spent a lot of time asking people for money to help us find a grassroots organizer who helped people go to Olympia and testify in hearings um, and all, everything that it takes behind the scenes to really like push uh, and create public pressure to actually make a difference. Um, so this experience really uh, led me to believe in the power, the intersection between nonprofits and advocacy. Um, each of us, all of us here on this call, we have representatives in the city council and the county council and the state legislators in the state legislature. And those representatives make decisions that affect us. And in the past, they've made decisions and created policies and passed bills that have created unjust systems. So as part of our reimagining work, SVP is developing programming that incorporates techniques such as advocacy, to change unjust systems, like it says on our website, what if philanthropy meant more than writing checks? And the way I think of it is, if writing checks means sharing wealth and skilled volunteering means sharing time and talent, then advocacy means sharing power by using your voice in support of a cause, a proposal, an initiative, or a bill that will make a difference in people's lives. So at SVP, uh, it's become a central tenet that advocacy must become critical to our collective work as philanthropists, as our existing culture of giving and service. We're just getting started. <laughs> the work to establish advocacy as part of our philanthropic model will build over the years. Um, we started last summer with a series of brainstorming discussions, and it was really important to open it up to as many people from the community who wanted to participate, which was great, and we got great feedback. Um, so from that, we've gone on to offer educational opportunities to SVP partners to learn about advocacy. There's a three-part workshop series that's been offered a couple times and we'll continue to offer and refine and look for feedback um, from what people are interested in learning in. But we've started with a um, workshop to, to introduce advocacy, um, like a 101 level class. And then if people are interested to learn more about the nitty gritty of what happens at the state level, there's, there's a workshop on that. And then finally, the importance of keeping equity issues in mind when engaging in advocacy work um, is a workshop led by Ruby Love. So the purpose of offering the advocacy training series is twofold. There's the first goal, which is providing enough knowledge and information so partners feel empowered to engage in their own independent advocacy efforts. Um, some of us, are following the criminal justice bills that are working their way through their le the legislature. Um, Terry Cole, who's a partner and lead partner for United Indians, has an email list that you can be added to where she tracks what different organizations are working on, what types of police reform bills are going through the legislature. Um, and even though the, the legislative session just ended, there are several bills that will be picked up again next January. So uh, the work is ongoing and you can start paying attention anytime and it's really easy to pick up. Um, so the second goal of the training series is to create opportunities to participate in advocacy activities in support 
of current or past partner organizations. Um, so for, for example, um, imagine a time when you get a newsletter from SVP that includes, um, you know, let's say let, next legislative session, call your representative to and encourage them to pass the Fair Start for Kids Act. Um, and it's literally, it, and it makes a huge difference. That was, this was my, the biggest takeaway from my experience uh, with Washington's Paramount Duty is a phone call makes a difference. Um, representatives care what their constituents think. And if you call them, they know that you represent a lot of other people who haven't picked up the phone. So don't ever think that um, it's not worth it to, send that email or make a call or go to a meeting and um, be curious. So um, in addition to the training series, what we've done is in January, we established the Advocacy Affinity Group. That means every, that meets every other Friday at noon. Um, we have signups on the website. Everybody is welcome. It's a informal open forum for partners and community leaders to discuss current advocacy issues and ask questions, to share ideas. This past Friday, we had four organizations that have, that have been funded by SVP and um, they talked about their work and what their advocacy needs are. Um, and what we're currently working on, like, future focused is um, continuing to connect with current and past organizations to learn about how we can amplify their advocacy efforts, such as calling and emailing legislators, attending a critical meeting, um, a public meeting or a private meeting, um, or testifying at a hearing, which I can tell you as an introvert <laughs> is not that hard in the sense that you literally get two minutes and you write a statement and you go up and you say, um, you know, you state your case and um, it makes a difference to do that. And luckily now with Zoom, you can do it virtually. You don't have to drive to Olympia. Um, the other thing we're working on is developing more educational forums around critical issues facing our communities and our state, such as police reform, progressive tax reform, and climate justice. Um, and we're very open. Um, if you have ideas or want to get involved with helping to organize um, educational programming, we're, again, just getting started laying the foundation for this type of work. This fall, we will be talking about local and county issues and laying the groundwork to prepare for the 2023 legislative session, which as I mentioned, would, will determine the state budget for two years. Um, down the road, once we have laid enough groundwork, SVP as an organization may choose through engaging partners and community leaders to support an initiative, it could be local or statewide or philanthropy, philanthropy focused. For example, um, the biggest thing we heard from community leaders that attended the call last Friday was the actual need to fund advocacy work within nonprofits. So because advocacy work isn't necessarily well understood as a possible avenue within a 501c3 a lot of foundations and philanthropists are um, not willing to fund it and um but in order to change unjust systems address systemic racism institutional racism etc um, advocacy is critical and so uh, there may be a time where we can organize to place a focus on that need within our community organizations and the nonprofit community at large. But for now, 
Uh, what's exciting is we're laying the foundation for a robust advocacy program, which will educate partners. And again, the goal in education, educating partners is that um, you can engage in your own individual advocacy work if there's anything that you're interested, particularly interested in, and also that you can join um, fellow partners in um, relationship with community organizations that we have funded and are currently funding and supporting and amplifying their advocacy work. So the aim is to educate and to amplify and then down the road to um, potentially do some collective action work as a full organization. So please join us as we lay this foundation. Um, contact us with any questions and um, thanks so much for listening. Thank you for that, Tali. Uh, I want to emphasize this offer from Tali. Really get connected with us. Email us. Uh, if you have our phone numbers, call us, but email is great. Um, and know that you don't, you're not obligated to just have one question and answer uh, session. Make it a conversation, get involved. Uh, what I hear from Tali with a lot of this is, this advocacy work is really about relationships and transforming relationships um, and using that to uh, wield power and change the nature of power. So thank you so much for uh, bringing, bringing that to light for us, Tali. Thanks. Well, I think that means I'm up next. Heather, if you could bring up the next slide. Good afternoon, everyone. So good to see your faces. Emiko Atherton here, the executive director, if I haven't met you. Thank you for taking time out of this really beautiful and what feels like now rare sunny day. I've been um, impatient <laughs> about waiting for spring, although my nose disagrees with me. I've been sneezing a lot, so excuse me in advance. Um, what I think, just big thank you to Gregory, big thank you to Julie, big thank you to Tolly. I think what we're hearing from all of this is really our reimagined vision in action, um, how we're showing up and how we can show up differently and create a, a really inclusive world. <laughs> culture, how we are also showing up and elevating um, our work beyond um, just our work in capacity building and grant making and learning, but through our elevation of others in advocacy and really towards systems change. Um, and then we wanted to end today talking about um, really one of the most transformative things I've been a part of since SVP, which is our new grant committee. Um, I'm going to do um, very little talking, give you just a little bit of background on the new grant committee, um, our first reimagined one. We're really going to be able to hear um, for about 15 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes from our co-chairs, Robert White and Pamela Oaks. And then at the end, um, we have a little teaser, so um, you can't, so don't tune up before we'll announce our new multi-year grantee here at SVP. Um, so this slide here just shows we had our largest new grant committee ever. Um, it actually extended beyond the screen, and this is just a screenshot I took from the first meeting. Um, but if you aren't familiar with our new grant committee, it was actually originally our, one of our primary learning committees. It was a way for partners to really learn about the nonprofit sector, to learn about grant making. Um, and it was, it could be anywhere from six to nine months where partners really deep dove into the grant application process. Um, and then really led sometimes over 100 nonprofits through an application process to select our multi-year investees. So it was both one of the most kind of transformational learnings for our partners, but it was also how it was the pipeline to bring in um, our multi-year investees. Um, Heather, if you could move to the next slide. Um, what we learned is through our, our real reimagined work is um, we knew that we wanted to co-create our, our programs together. 
Um, this was really paramount is that learning and continuing to evolve and iterate and evolve was part of the reimagined vision, which we announced about a year ago. It was actually April of 2021. And so the first programs we actually launched from those were our summer of co-creation, where we had three working groups. We had a learning journeys co-creation group that many of you were part of. We had an advocacy co-creation learning group that Tali referenced in her last talk. And we also had a grant making where we had past partners, current partners, um, past investees, current investees, and people who had actually applied and not received grants come together to really talk about how um, what were the dynamics within that? What could a reimagined grant committee look like? And from those that really three in-depth discussions, we came up with what we really wanted to do um, from this feedback and from this co-creation, create a process for our new grant fall that would um, remove the burden from interested nonprofits and then address the power dynamics between those who decided the grant and those who wanted to receive the grant. Because what we had heard is that it was pretty well, this was a really transformational learning experience for those who had um, participated as partners, it was often a really burdensome process for nonprofit applicants. Um, and that sometimes they felt like there was an unequal power dynamic. And so how can we really shift power and remove burden within this, um, which was the real birth of our new reimagined NGC. Heather, can we move to the next slide, please? Um, and so with that, um, we had 26 people participate in this new grant committee. Um, and what's really exciting is over half of those, over 50% came from what we're calling community partners or, or people who were either working for, rooted with a community-based nonprofit here in King County. Um, and the other half were um, individual partners. And because this was such a large group, they actually split into sub two subgroups that explored two different ways of giving um, because we were going to give and we are giving to, um, to we're welcoming two multi-year investees starting with two $25,000 grants as well as our capacity building and relationship. One looked at nominations and one looked at a letter of intent. So the nomination group um, really worked on creating a process that would nominate an organization where our community partners ended up nominating um, different organizations. It really streamlined the application process. And then, um, oh, and I'm sorry, those got swapped around. Um, and then um, the decision would actually be made through a lottery process or a random selection that staff would implement. And this really got to, um, trying to figure out how do you decide a group is worthy. These groups were nominated by community by our community partners in the committee. Who is really the right decision makers? Is to, so to use random selection, the letter of intent group, and my apologies, it looks like the two are switched, would work on creating a diversified process for outreach. So really making sure that organizations that might not know about SVP get notified but they also wanted to streamline the application process um, and remove bias. So they ended up coming with the process where really staff would implement a lot of outreach. And then again, to get with the issue of decision-making, they actually separately decided on the random selection process. Um, I know I'm talking pretty quickly, but all of this is covered in a lessons learned report, which Heather, if you move to the next slide, um, you will be available right after this report. Um, but what I wanted to do is not to hear from me, but just to give you a little bit of background. And you can really hear about the process from our two co-chairs um, who you may have seen around virtually. Uh, Robert White, who's an SVP board member and Pamela Oaks of the Profitable Nonprofit. So at this time, we're really going to move into just hearing about some of these lessons learned. And as we move to welcoming Pamela and Robert to the screen, um, and we can just take down this slide, um, remembering that the primary objective for really the reimagined process and this new reimagined grant committee was to learn. And to remember that learning was the primary, um, our primary goal and objective and that, um, and that this conversation is part of those learnings. So welcome Pamela and Robert, so good to see you. Um, I just wanted to start out and, you know, as the co-chairs, what is something that you learned uniquely in your role as both chair and facilitator of the committees? And um, Pamela, you're off mute. So if you want to go first and then Robert, if you want to follow up. 
Yes, thank you, Emiko. Um, one of the biggest lessons that I learned was people's misunderstanding of what trust-based philanthropy is. And the whole point is to kind of shift the power dynamic. But for most people, it seemed like it was, um, uh, you know, we have all this money and we're going to do you a favor by making it easier for you to get the money. And that's not the basis of trust-based philanthropy. Trust-based philanthropy is born out of the idea um, originally that um, all those accumulations of wealth were born on the backs and by the sweat and by the might of black and brown communities. And in the spirit of social justice, it is not, um, it is not an option, but a duty to be able to redistribute that wealth back into communities who most need it. So when you think of it in that terms, then it's like, yes, let's get that money out the door. But if it's a favor, it's like, well, let's put some strings on and how that money gets out and what we do with that. So I, I think that was my biggest um, eye opener was, was people's hesitancy to want to give away money and to, to, to organizations that wanted it and that needed it and, and, um, and kind of the pushback for giving money where it's needed. Um, I think that was the, the biggest eye opener for me. What about you, Robert? Yeah, I, I would second that. Yeah, hello everybody. Uh, I definitely would second that. Um, I think the first lesson I learned is I could not share this by myself. So I, I was so happy and just and humble that Pamela, you know, agreed to co-chair this and to come along on this journey and this experience with me. Uh, I also know as a facilitator uh, doing this, what I really learned was how challenging it can be to navigate these multiple, you know, cultures and perspectives, especially as Pam was sharing, like within a constrained environment, within time frame, within certain things, and, and seeing how we identify as partners and we identify as community and how does that come together? Um, for me as facilitator, that was the biggest lesson learned. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's great. So, um, my second question is, you know, I talked about really, this was about learning and it was about shifting money and power and inviting more people in. Um, part of that learning is that, you know, we're not going to learn in vain, but that we wanna do this again, that we're really, a lot of the reimagined spirit is about piloting ideas, seeing what works, um, and then re like kind of readjusting and trying it again. So I say that as, what is a recommendation you would have for the next kind of grant committee that get, that gathers here at SVP? Something that you learned that we could um, incorporate into the next process? Well, I think one of the um, greatest things that, that was incorporated in this process was that spirit of learning and that this is a pilot and we will learn as we go. And um, people wanted, I found that people wanted it to be this perfect process the first time out. And it's like um, a lot of those learnings will come in the doing, not in trying to figure it all out uh, beforehand. And um, I think that idea of really people coming to the table with an open mind to do something different out of the box, something that hasn't been done before and be an open to, to what, to all that that may um, entail, even if, it means that the first time you do it, then there possibly could be some negative effects to that, you know? And I think people were afraid of, of what the negatives might be, the unknown. They were afraid of the unknown. And I think Imiko, as you, as you said so often, and that needs to be reiterated is, what's the worst that can happen? <laughs> How bad can it be? We're giving money to a great organization. How bad? What is the worst that could possibly happen, right? Um, and so that, that there was that idea that there is no bad grant. And I think people could not wrap their heads around that. that um, and so, but coming with that open mind and that open recognition that um, it's all good, the, the good, the bad and the ugly is gonna be good moving forward. And that you'll get to that, that if there is that perfect place or that perfect grant um, um, in the future, but, but this is a trial. We have to, doing something new, um, there is that, there, there is some unknowns involved. Yeah, I would say the, you know, 
continue building that culture of trust-based philanthropy. Uh, one recommendation uh, going along with that, and it actually just popped in my head as I already had some you know, answers thought about, really was thinking of how, how do we get these larger philanthropic organizations to come audit our new grant committee, have them come have a seat at the table and see what it looks like. They, they don't have the, the voice or the vote or the power. They're there to learn and, and have them sit at the table to learn. So then now we're expanding that culture and, and then building it with them to see how it looks because then they'll invite us to that. The other part I would say with that is we have to expand our community. We have great partners. Uh, we have a great community. There's more of the community that needs to be brought in uh, to help improve this human-centered design process uh, to expand this, you know, again, the culture of trust-based philanthropy. That's great. Thank you both. Um, Robert, you started to touch on this, but one of, you know, one of our hopes in creating this new grant committee is to really um, live into our history of um, setting the bar for the rest of philanthropy and really, you know, continuing to push. One of the reasons that I love SVP is how nimble we are. Um, you know, we, we are able to really bring that spirit of innovation and piloting into our work. And so, Robert, you started to talk about this, but I'd love to hear more about what is something that, you know, we encourage, what is something we learned or one takeaway that we encourage the rest of philanthropy to really, or other organizations to adopt? Yeah, I know it says one takeaway. I always like breaking rules. I have two short ones that make up one, I would say. They kind of go in the same vein together. The radical transparency is paramount in redesigning systems and processes. Like this philanthropic community must give up power. So that's a big takeaway that we have to share. And I think when I suggested them come sitting at the table and auditing it, they will realize that and see that. The second goes along with what I just shared a little bit a second ago about the human-centered design is important in reimagining grant making. It's nothing new that we know that the answers to our challenges and problems live within a community. Organizations have to lean into that, believing the place, uh, the, the people who face these specific challenges every day are the ones who hold the key to solving them. And until we like lean into that, it, we're going to continually just keep uh, tripping on our uh, shoes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, uh, can you, I'm sorry, Emma, can you repeat that question? <laughs> Yeah, of course. I was so into what Robert was saying. It was so good. <laughs> so hard to go second to. Um, what is one takeaway we should what that you know we should encourage um, the rest of philanthropy and other organizations to do from this process? Yes. So it really is as this is kind of to reiterate what Robert said is um, um, about the the idea of giving up power about that those philanthropic funds. If the idea is to that you have these funds and it is to do this work, then get that money out the door. Why are you so consumed with being able to dictate how that money is spent, who gets that money, who's worthy? And, and um, that is the essence of power. And if you want to, you're gonna to have to suspend power or share that power or just give up that power if you want to reimagine the grant process. That's great, I love that. Um, so what else, what haven't I asked? Cause I know we, we don't have, I don't have a ton of time although I've got to spend so much time with you. Um, both any kind of final words you'd like to share with uh, your fellow SVP community about the new grant committee or kind of a call to action? Well, I, my call to action would be for, um, for not only people on the committee uh, to be involved in the committee, to, in, um, to spread the word about it so that people in the community who can, who, who, can start hearing about these grants and and because there is there there's going to be that too when the when the grant uh, philanthropic process has had so many strings attached when you tell people oh yeah we're just giving you some money that then there no one's going to believe that there is a trust there's a mistrust in the in the um, communities about what does it mean if I take this money, right? Because they're so, they're, they're used to having this power control over them once they take that money. So it's like, do I want this money? What's, what's you know, what is in it for them? No way are they just giving this money away. So um, the more um, word of mouth 
that the community that this group could do um, through SVP to share that message to make sure that people understand the purpose and the function of it will go a long way in helping to gain momentum for trust-based philanthropy. Yeah, a final say my call to action is those who are on this call, those who will watch this recording, those who receive our emails, like join the next new grant committee, get involved in it. Um, if you're sitting on the sidelines and you love what you're hearing, now's the time to get in. The coach is ready to put you in. Uh, I do want to make sure it's recognized that this work was, is hard. It was mm -hmm. transformative, not transactional. Um, as an SVP partner and board member, we accomplished something radical I never thought we would. Um, I'm humbled, and I have to finish with this, I'm very humbled and honored to have been able to co-chair this and co-create this experience. Uh, it was probably the most transformative experience uh, of my philanthropic um, you know, journey. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, uh, Pamela and Robert. We, uh, we're so honored that you shared our time and talent, as well as the other 24 members of the committee, um, some of who were here, um, some of whom had to leave, but it was just, it was a really wonderful experience. If you want to learn more, as I mentioned today, um, we will have a lessons learned report out um, that really is not just staff lessons learned, um, but we had discussions within um, the committee, we also did a survey and um, a survey, we did interviews and all of those lessons that we learned about piloting a new process, um, we, we have in a lessons learned report. So back to some of the logistics, because it's okay if you're not following. Um, so there were um, 26 people. So we ended up splitting into two groups. And really the charge was again, to develop two different processes for grant making. After some research and discussion, two different subgroups were formed. One created a nominations process and one created a letter of intent process. The nominations process, again, took the community partners and had them nominate groups. What happened is then we asked the groups um, if they wanted to opt in to be in a, a possible candidate. And then um, we use random selection to pick them and I'll announce that new um, multi-year grantee and our new relationship soon. The second process, which is actually gonna kick off in the next week or two, is the letter of intent process. So it's a way for people to indicate they're interested in being in relationship with SVP in a funded relationship, but also one of deep learning, one of advocacy, one of capacity building. And they can submit a letter, they can submit, um, they can submit a video, they can do a telephone call, a video call. We're really opening up the ways people can indicate, but we're also putting a lot of work on ourselves to reach out and to make sure people know about this opportunity and people know about SVP. So that process will start next week. Um, but what I'm really excited at 125, almost on the dot, is to say we the nominations process is done. And last week, we randomly selected our newest multi-year relationship to SVP. And we're really excited there actually here with us today. So with that, I want to welcome uh, Choose 180. And if you are not familiar with Choose 180, they were actually a fast pitch winner and that's how they got introduced to the SVP community. We've got Sean Good, their amazing executive director here today. And uh, Sean, I, didn't, I don't know if I asked you in advance if you wanna say anything, but it's so good you can be here um, as we welcome you to the partnership. Thank you, my friends. And, and if I understand this right, I have five minutes, right? Isn't that how this yeah. thing works? No, I'm yeah, kidding. Yeah, you've got the final okay. five. <laughs> yeah, no, um, I, I, I'm grateful. Uh, I'm excited about this LOI process that I just learned about right now. I mean, a letter, telephone, video. Can I just swipe left or right? Is that can I, Does that work too? I mean, is it that basic out here for me to be able to choose what I want to be in this committed relationship with SEP? Like, I'm all about this situation and so will our grants manager. Um, she'll be excited to know the labor that we'll, we won't be embodying as a result of being able to receive these resources and be chosen. Um, like being invited to be randomly selected for a possibility is the most um, peculiar grant call that I've ever received um, or email. Like we're going, we, we want to choose you um, to be in a raffle and as you're in a raffle, you may or may not get chosen. And I'm like, there's no, 
there's no bias, right? Like I can't just charm people into saying yes. Like, like what, what does this even mean, right? Like you're supposed to love me because of my charisma, not because of some random selection. Um, and and to still be chosen makes me feel like the whole world still works in our advantage. So um, no, I kid, but I'm grateful, I'm honored, and it's cool to be in this space with so many people who I really love, appreciate, and adore, and grateful to continue to find our ways to be part of the SVP community. Um, thank you so very much. That's great. And that was, um, you know, that was less than five minutes. So I just wanted to say again, like, big thank you. Um, as for all of you who are familiar with SVP, there'll be so many opportunities to be in relationship with um, everyone at Choose 180. So we'll start those conversations soon and we'll be looking to uh, figure out ways to really continue to connect and build. Um, if you don't know Choose 180, what they do is they transform systems of injustice and support the young people who are too often impacted by these systems. And they have an incredible uh, suite of programming. They do workshops, half-day workshops. They do felony interventions. They do um, school-based diversions, uh, they have success coaches, and they actually also have their own advocacy program for their youth who want to advocate and participate in systems change. So I think we can learn a ton from them as we really build this relationship. Um, so welcome and stay tuned for more information. Um, I just want to end today by thanking you all, thanking everyone that that really all year long makes SVP possible. Um, we are so great. Um, there are a ton of ways to continue to get involved. Um, just next week, I highlighted we have two things coming up. The letter from Birmingham Discussion Group. It's a three-day discussion group led by one of our new partners. Um, and we should, we should absolutely come to that. We're also partnering with the Washington Women's Foundation and Progress Alliance on the Whiteness of Wealth Book Club, which is starting next week. And then I've listed up other things that are coming up. We've always got our advocacy affinity group, co-creation. These are monthly to bi-monthly things that are happening. Our collaborative grant-making cohorts, which um, Pamela didn't mention, but she'll be chairing. These are uh, formerly known as our collective action teams or CATCH. Pamela will be chairing the EDUCAT, or now the Edu CGC, because we love acronyms here. And capacity building, if you are looking to get involved, we have a lot of need from our partners to do communications, marketing, storytelling. So please get in touch. Um, and I just want to thank everybody. Um, this is a beautiful day. And so I, you know, I'm looking at some myself and so honored that you spent it with us and really spent it in this community that I love. Um, I, I am just honored to share the space with you every day, whether it's virtually or hopefully in person soon. And um, welcome, welcome Choose One Eating, welcome Sean and the rest of you, I hope get to see you around in person or virtually soon. We'll send a follow up with the video, the lessons learned report, there'll be a link. Um, and it's our first publication in a while and we're really excited to have that and just continued opportunities to get engaged. So thank you and see you all soon.